Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems, and welcome back to MX Bikes today, where we're going to be playing the 2020 St. Louis Supercross replica made by Ruben Kilder. You guys may have already seen me do a video on this track, so it's not uh, uncharted territory, but I'm going to do it again today because we're going to recap the 2020 St. Louis Supercross that happened in real life over the weekend as a bit of a synopsis here today. Um, normally speaking, I kind of do these in Monster Energy Supercross 2 where I recap each week, but um, I actually realized that I was like ahead on the tracks every week, so I need to like give myself a week off from doing the track beforehand and then do the track after. And that'll give me the advantage of showing the track off in sim the week of the race and then showing the uh, actual like how the track showed up in real life in Monster Energy Supercross after, so we'll go ahead and go back to that format next week, but this week, because St. Louis was made in MX Bikes and I wanted to uh, at least give you guys a recap video from St. Louis in real life, um, I figured this would be a good way of doing it, playing a track that I already kind of am familiar with, and uh, yeah, let's jump in, shall we? All right, 2020 St. Louis Supercross, looking at the 450 class first, of course. Um, if you're just joining me here today on this channel for the first time, or maybe you've seen me do stuff before, um, head over to RacerX Online, by the way, or RacerX's YouTube channel, uh, because I actually did a, a fun little like synopsis video of a couple key points from the main event in the 450 class at St. Louis. Uh, that was a lot of fun to make, and I'm going to be doing a lot more of that at RacerX, so uh, you can see more of that like real-life kind of synopsizing of things. Um, but basically one of the key points that I hit on that we can talk about in this video was Eli Tomac's dreadful start in the main event, which is becoming a bit of a pattern a little bit too quickly here. Um, now in his start in the main event, one thing that, that happened for sure is he would have been probably closer to like 12th off the line, but, uh, he got stood up in the first corner when Plessinger almost went down off of Justin Hill's rear tire. So it made it worse than it like really actually was, but... If he keeps getting starts where he's going to be, you know, 10th or worse off the gate, things like that are going to happen where guys are going to crash in front of him or weird things are going to happen. Um, and in this case, it was just a, a weird little mishap where Plessinger got stood up in the in the first turn and, and Tomac had nowhere to go. So he had to almost come to a complete stop and then he ended up crossing the whole shot line in 19th place. Now that's a disaster obviously because the winner of the race, Ken Roxon, started the race basically in second. He came through the first corner like fourth or fifth but then triple tripled his way in and then was in second behind Zach Osborne almost immediately and then took the lead pretty quickly and then yeah he was off and running with the lead. So if Tomac's gonna win races, let's just forget about the championship for a second. If he's gonna win races, I think personally speaking, he's gonna need to get better starts. Um, I had people telling me that it's not just his starts, other things are a factor, and you're right. He has said that he's had arm pump this year, and uh, generally speaking, it looks like it's been a bit tougher to get through the field than it has in years past, so that's another thing as well. But it's not the same level of Eli Tomac starts that we've seen in the past like yes we've seen him get starts maybe that bad before uh, but two weeks in two pretty bad starts to start the year not a good start to his season whatsoever um, but talking about Ken Roxon and him going on to win the main event I was so excited to see Kenny back on the top step of the podium I mean it's been such a long journey back um, my wife was sitting next to me on the couch as I was watching it I was not in St. Louis over the weekend and after the race, she was in tears because it, it, it literally has been that crazy of a journey back. And we were both in the stadium. My wife and I were both in the stadium when uh, Kenny last had won a Supercross back in 2017. So it, it's it been a while, you know. It was almost three years to the day. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened with him with the arm injury, with Blake Savage, his brother-in-law, getting paralyzed. Um and yeah, just a, a crazy, crazy, crazy road for Roxon back to the top step. And it was emotional and it was really, really cool to see. Now, I will agree with you folks that I've seen complaining about the fact that they basically ignored everything else on the last lap to cover Roxon's win. Um, that They absolutely did do that and we missed some crazy stuff happening. Like Tomac went from sixth to fourth on the last lap. Adam Sincerlo fell. Uh, a couple other things like that were happening and we just basically glossed over because Kenny was about to win his first race in three years. And while that is like 
really, 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 really cool. It still would have been nice to at least see a little bit of what was going on back there. Um, Cause I don't even know personally what happened. And, and like I've talked to a couple of people that I work with at Racer X and, and they kind of were following the rocks and saga as well. So it wasn't like fully documented what was going on. Uh, but yeah, Tomac almost finished sixth and uh, was, I guess, a little bit fortunate to get around Osborne there late and then seeing Cerullo fell. Um, which, you know, seeing Cerullo, if he didn't fall there, I think would have still been second in the championship. Not 100% sure how that math would have checked out. 2 4 beats a 6 1, I, I think. I don't know. Um, but then he went back to, what was it, seventh? So 2 7, not uh, terrible, but I'm sure Cian Cerullo is going to be kicking himself to run fourth the entire main event, basically, and then, and then fall. But uh, anyway, I feel like the man we really should be talking about here that not many people are is Justin Barsha, because Barsha is now, you know, gone 1 2, and this week he was very, very sick, uh, just like Cooper Webb was last week in the post race interviews on the podium. You could, you could just see it, how much, you know, mentally or physically it was of a drain to be, like, physically ill and try to race those 20-minute main events uh, in Supercross. It was, it seemed pretty tough for Barsha. It was pretty tough for Webb as well. And, uh, yeah, Barsha was on the box again. Another great start, another solid 20 minutes. Um, just because he's never put a full 17 rounds together before i'm gonna remain skeptical about championship hopes for him but early in this season it's looking a lot better than it did last year at least i feel like i, I really do s somewhat believe that this like 2018 barsha that we saw when he got the fill-in on factory yamaha is is there again whereas like 2019 he won the opener he said his bike settings were good but then now he tells us his bike settings were not good and it kind of showed that it was well off when they went to Glendale and he just didn't look the part at all um, but you know St. Louis completely different dirt than Anaheim yeah technically still a dry race but um, you know I think that you know he's looking like he's pretty well versed on all soils at this point which is really really good to see because I'm I'm stoked to see whether or not Barsha can kind of like turn this into a legitimate championship run we we talk about Tomac we talk about Anderson we talk about Webb we talk about Rocks we talk about these guys that are for lack of a better term your true championship contenders but two weeks in Justin Barsha top of the points two weeks in a row and he's been on the box two weeks in a row the only guy that's been able to do that so I don't know. We'll have to see what happens in Anaheim this weekend. It is not a triple crown, so that's um, kind of like almost a good thing, I feel, so that it's not like so chaotic right off the bat and Barsha has to deal with this mess right away. He'll have to deal with it in Glendale the following week, but at least for right now, if he can just put in another solid main event and maybe even extend his points lead, going to be sitting pretty nice going into this first triple crown that he can hopefully just you know have a decent night and not have to worry about blowing it all up there. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at Barsha as a guy that's like kind of almost impressing me at this point is like, damn dude, he's kind of got this thing figured out early and we'll have to see if that momentum, uh, carries true. Now, I think one person that nobody is talking about in terms of championship scenarios anymore, which is weird because he was like one of the top four guys you talked about in championships, uh, scenarios going into the season is Jason Anderson, who's now gone five, three. And in both main events, he's looked like pretty just like rock solid, like no real major mistakes to talk about. Um, he had a really gnarly moment in his heat race where he went off the track, but uh, was fortunate enough not to like actually go down or get severely hurt or anything like that. But in the main events, he's been perfect, I feel like. Uh, yeah, has he only got one podium and he's won 5-3 and it's not like amazing or anything like that, but... You kind of start a season with a little bit of momentum going like that while others are maybe having some ups and downs like Kenny and Tomac both had downs at A1 and then Kenny's obviously on, a, on an up right now and Tomac, I don't know where you would put his headspace at. Um, but Webb was an up at A1 and now he's a down here because he finished 12th. So then you have uh, Anderson who's able to go 5-3. I think he's second in points now. I feel like that's a, like a boat of confidence there to... You know, almost say, "Hey, yeah, we we're in a good spot here. 
We started the season strong. We're not behind or anything like that. And moving forward, he can almost like start trying to focus more on race victories instead of let's just get through the first couple of rounds because he's already done like the the, the groundwork, if you will, the, the base work of building a championship genre in his own you know setup, if you will. So. I, uh, I think Anderson is a little bit more dangerous here than people are giving him credit for. Yes, he hasn't been lights out crazy yet, but we know that speed exists. We know hang it out Jace Anderson is in there. If he is taking this more measured approach to start the season and knows that he can hang it out a little bit later in the season, kind of look out, folks. He may be pretty darn good. Uh, so I like where Barsh is at. I really like where Anderson's at. I, I just don't have a good answer on Barsha, and so Anderson is kind of the guy that I'm looking at as like, wow, he's done pretty good for the couple rounds. Um, has it been like masterfully so more better than Tomac or better than Roxon or anything like that? No, but pretty good position, I would say. And uh, yeah, so Kenny gets his first win. Barsha leading the points still. Tomac has got to figure out starts. Anderson, I think, is in a much better position people are giving him credit for. And Cooper Webb has got to go back to the drawing board. It sounds like he was still actually fairly sick this week and wasn't able to like fully get over the, the bug that he had at Anaheim 1. So that's probably part of him finishing 12th. But I also do feel on some level that this is just kind of the nature of the field that we have right now. While Tomac has the on and off speed that looks insane and incredible, I think when Tomac is having a regular day, you could throw a blanket over basically the top 12, which is where Cooper Webb went back to, as like uh, these guys can win main events and do crazy things. I think I saw, I want to say it was a pro, I'm not sure who it was, but they posted the results sheet from the main event and it was like, yeah, everybody except Justin Brayton in like the top 13 or something like that has a uh, 250 or 450 championship to their name, which I, I've gone through and seen that list before as well, but it's insane. Like you, you know, just going down the top five, you have um, Barsha, who is a two-time 250 Supercross champion, finishing second. Roxon, who is a uh, 250 Supercross champion, two-time outdoor national champion, winning the race. Jason Anderson, 2018 Supercross champion, 2014 250 West champion, uh, finishing on the podium. Then you have um, Tomac, who, you know, track record speaks for itself. Most wins of anybody last couple of years. Three-time outdoor champion, four-time outdoor champion, if you count as uh, 250 championship in 2013. And then Zach Osborne, who is a two-time 250 Supercross champion and a one-time 250 Outdoor champion. Like, this is, like, stacked as stacked can be in the top five, and we haven't even got to some of the heavy hitters, like the defending champion himself, Cooper Webb, down in 12th. So pretty, pretty crazy um, list of statistics you can kind of reel off there as the who's who of what's going on at front in the front of the field right now. And I think... Uh, at least so far, we've got ourselves set up a pretty interesting championship with the first couple rounds being a little bit more open than expected. Like I said, like Barsh has been as solid as he has been in two rounds and, and maybe can carry this momentum further, but he wasn't really like ever expected to be this guy, I feel like, coming into this season. And now he's suddenly in this position and everybody else has had these like kind of weirdo scores. A 6-1 for Roxon, a 7-4 uh, for Tomac, a 2-7 for Cian Cerullo. Webb with a 312, like scores all over the board. Yeah, Baggett was what, a, a 411 this weekend or something like that? Yeah, so it's it's crazy. I'm very excited to see what's gonna happen this weekend in Anaheim, because then I feel like we're gonna get more of an indication on where the series is headed. Last year, obviously, Cooper Webb won at A2 and uh, kind of kickstarted his championship run. So maybe something like that happens again. I'm not saying it's going to be Cooper Webb, but somebody could impress this weekend, maybe win, and uh, get themselves into a different situation moving towards the championship. Let's talk about the 250 class, so I don't want to get uh, too deep into this video or crazy about it tonight. But uh, yeah, 250 class action. Hey, guess what, folks? Look at the number on my back of my jersey right here. I love the number 52 been wearing it for 11 no 10 years now 10 years running 52 in both like real life racing that i sometimes do occasionally and then obviously racing video games and all that fun stuff i love the number 52 and austin forkner baby putting the number 52 on the top step of the box this weekend in st louis kind of weird to see if i'm honest with you because uh, no normally 52 is not a number that like is associated with someone who's winning a lot um 
you know, I love some of the guys that ran 52 over the years, but uh, usually they aren't going to be like winning races. Uh, just because Forkner missed a chunk of the season last year, he ends up with 52 as a national number because it's not a career number. And uh, takes the win in St. Louis, his home race as it were, because he's from Missouri, but he's like from the other side of the state, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know geography well enough to fully say that's true. Um, but uh, yeah, Forkner, two rounds in. So I will say he's looked good, but he definitely has not looked like last year Austin Forkner good to me. Uh, some people may disagree. But, like, last year, Austin Forkner was, like, pulling 15-second leads on Justin Cooper, no problem. And Justin Cooper, I think, has actually gotten better, so that's not going to, like, say a huge discredit to him or anything like that. I think Cooper has really stepped his game up. But I do still think that peak Austin Forkner is beating Justin Cooper, like, no problem. And Justin Cooper came from pretty far back and was getting fairly close by the end of the main event to catching Forkner. Like, it didn't happen. I get it, but he wasn't like way, 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 way off from catching him towards the end there. So that's kind of interesting, I think, to, to make note of. And now Cooper went 2-2, uh, two, two, right? For uh, No, sorry, 1-2. Ugh, forgot he won the opener. He's gone 1-2 now and maintains the points lead, so the Yamahas will still have the red backgrounds next week. Um, but I think like kind of the biggest talking point that we really could hit on besides the front pack is what was going on with Dylan Ferrandis, which was kind of chaotic. And this is what I was talking about with Tomac in the 450 class, where you leave yourself open to some, you know, negative impact type things. If you continuously get bad starts in Ferrandis' case, he's not a great starter in the first place, but this one was a particular bad, particularly bad one ends up pretty far down the field. I want to say he was like at least 12th, 13th, 14th, somewhere in there going down the first rhythm lane. Maybe a little higher, maybe closer to 10th. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a, a sketchy moment where Alex Martin kind of cased the rhythm jump and went sideways towards Michael Moseman. Moseman had nowhere to go, and Moseman kind of jumped sideways, and Ferrandis just like fully like mid-air landed on Moseman. A uh, very similar situation to Jet Lawrence and Teki Koga in the heat race, I think it was. I, th I believe that's who it was. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of scary because it looked like at first both of them were hurt. It looks like Moseman was able to get up and be relatively okay because he looked like the one that was most jacked up from it. Ferrandis got going and was immediately put a lap down basically because he went back in the mechanics area to get his bike like straightened out and uh, then yeah was uh, basically a lap down from there and this is where I'll give like credit where credit's due he just kind of stuck in with that lead group after they went by him I think he ended up like if you put the lead group at the finish line I think he was about 10-15 seconds behind Forkner crossing the finish line at the end of the main event so he just kind of was with them and he played it smart by just getting with that group and when they were going through lappers quite honestly i think other riders who he was in a actual battle for position with probably thought he was lapping them and just moved right out of the way so he went from pretty far down the running order up to 12th by the end of it still finishing lap down of course but i think that 12th is kind of crucial because championship points mean everything in these short little series that these regional supercross championships are and uh, Ferrandis kind of almost saved his championship hopes, I think, with a ride like that. If he gets a DNF there, I'm very skeptical he's able to pull it back from that, uh, given the nature of Cooper. You know, his podium streaks are incredible. Forkner is almost unbeatable when he doesn't hit the ground, but I think that he hits the ground still a little bit too often. But Ferrandis, I think, is only 14, maybe 15 points down in the championship after salvaging a night like that. You know, he comes out and wins this weekend, for example. Then he's, you know, at best, or I would say at worst, only 12 points down a Forkner, but probably even better than that, given kind of how things play out. So I think that's a pretty big deal. I don't think many people talked about it. I don't think many people watched it. But Ferrandez finishing 12th there, very, very important uh, to get that high up into the, uh, the finishing order there. Um, 
So let's talk about a couple of the other kind of key things that were going on in the midst of all this that kind of caused some of the chaos as well. Um, first of all, very, 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 very impressed with Jet Lawrence in the main event. Um, he had a rough day, he had a rough night, etc. And then to come out and start up front in the main event, he almost whole shot. I think Forkner got him by like one millisecond, you know, millimeter, millisecond, whatever you want to call it. And uh, and Lawrence settled in a second and then stayed there for a very long time. And honestly, there was a couple moments where I was like, is he going to catch Forkner and pass him for the lead? Like, just sticking right with him. No problemo. And uh, towards like the middle of the race, I think is when like kind of the the fade was starting to happen a little bit, which is almost like a natural point of the race there for someone who's never really done this type of racing. Like it's a second actual professional race, so still pretty early on in the the goings of figuring this all out. Um, and I feel like he was losing it a little bit, but he kind of gathered himself after Cooper passed him. Uh, it was just unfortunate that he clipped his, his uh, um, brake pedal on a tough block and it ripped it all the way backwards, which is why he had to come into the pits. And it looked really weird because Christian Craig crashed at the same time, so he thought it maybe had something to do with it. Um, but from what I understand, I don't think it had anything to do with it. I think he just by himself clipped a tough block and ripped the, the brake pedal backwards. So he came in, got it fixed, came back out, and still uh, managed to get his first career top five. I think that's pretty gnarly. Like... For a kid that's 16 years old in his second pro race to go out there and basically tail one of the best 250 riders in the class, like the guy that was literally top of the power rankings at the beginning of the season, just stick right on him for, I don't know, 10 laps it was or so, where he was just right behind Forkner, just watching his moves and impressive stuff, I will say. So I, I'm I'm uh, I'm all aboard the jet train in a couple of years. I think right now he's not going to win the title, win races, etc. But I think by next year he'll win races, and I think by 2022 he'll be championship contender material no doubt and he'll only be 18 that's crazy i can't believe that um yeah so that was that was pretty cool and then shout out brandon heart ramped who or heart raft heart ramped whatever you want to call it uh people say the n is silent don't know how the n can be silent in the middle of all that jumble but anyway heart raft for getting his first career podium that's great man this tld ktm needs a shot in the arm like no freaking other they have been up and down and through hell and back these last couple basically a couple months but these couple of years have been real rough uh jesse nelson getting paralyzed kind of i feel like kicked off a, a bad luck train for tld ktm that just never seemed to come back and it's nice to see you know one of the the good guys in the paddock heart ramped is a really hard working kid and then you know gets coupled up with a factory team and almost immediately repays them with his his first podium or i guess they pay repay him with his first career podium i don't know how you want to look at that scenario but whatever way you want to look at it it's just really cool man heart raft is a good kid works hard puts in the hours and to see him reap those benefits is just it's really kind of a joy for me to watch something like that happen so that was really really cool i was very bummed to see christian craig um go out i guess uh it sounds like he just like kind of it was a crash it wasn't a huge crash but it was a crash and then he just hit his side in a way that knocked the wind completely out of him and yeah i mean once he kind of regained his composure after a couple laps there of the wind being knocked out of you you're three laps down and you've lost basically anything that you could have gained out of a great night of racing and and that's a total bummer because craig i think was looking stellar he was you know basically in a situation where he would have been second in the championship uh or third in the championship i should say after that night of racing and been in a pretty darn good position points wise still and then obviously it, it all went south there so that was definitely kind of a bummer there but um Hopefully he regroups and uh, comes back swinging in Anaheim this week. But uh, that's 250 synopsis. That's St. Louis synopsis as we ride St. Louis 2020 and MX bikes playing Ruben Kilder's track here. Lovely stuff. Um, just uh, having a grand old time here playing the game. Hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of recap discussion. Like I said, uh, we'll be back in Monster Energy Supercross to the official video game next week for recap stuff so just a little mx bikes fun for today um but yeah appreciate you guys stopping by to watch as always and i hope you guys will always come back and watch more content here on the channel all right 
Kellen here on Star Your System saying, I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.